Uh, we found this little video clip, it's about two minutes on Thanksgiving. I want to watch it and then I'm going to pray as we begin our service, okay? Maybe you will just again this week think through what God has blessed you with and uh, be really realizing that without the Lord as our Savior, where would we be? I guarantee you we wouldn't be sitting here uh, most likely. And uh, so I hope it helps you to get your heart prepared for giving of thanks. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning we come to this service knowing that sometimes we have forgotten your blessings. Sometimes we didn't pay much attention to them and so we didn't forget them, we just never noticed them. And so this morning, Father, I pray that you would get a hold of our hearts, that we might be people of praise, that we might genuinely lift up our voices to praise you for who you are, for what you've done. Father, this morning we will sing songs of worship May they be truly from our hearts, generated by a heart of praise. I would ask you too, Lord, that this morning as we meet together, we might be so thankful that you have met the needs of so many in our church over the last couple of weeks. Folks that have hurt themselves and been in hospitals and some are home, some are still in hospitals. I thank you, Lord, for meeting the needs of those who have lost loved ones and I do think of even the Schmiederbergs this morning as Jerome and his family deal with the loss of Sharon. Father I thank you that even this morning that we can look around us and realize that we have a great privilege to share Christ with this community. I thank you that this church is a light in this in this corner of Los Gatos and Montesorino and this church has been a light since 1916, from the days of being downtown Los Gatos to now being here, we pray that our light will continue to shine. I pray for the folks that drove onto our parking lot last night, some of whom only came to go see the lights of the Christmas display at Vasona Park. How I pray that 
you would allow them to see the light of the gospel being shined out through this place. That really the light that they might have seen last night, more importantly, was the light of your son. Father, I just would pray that everything that we do would be brought to your glory and to your honor. Just motivate us now, Father, by your love and mercy. May you show us what it means to be thankful. And may our potluck and our afternoon service, the things that we do together, may they be used to draw us to each other and to one another. And may it be an opportunity for us to know each other better so that we can pray and lift one another up. Thank you for your grace in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymn books this morning and turn to number 562, 562, then stand together as we sing it, Rejoice, Ye Pure in Heart. and sing. Greet one another this morning with hearts of thankfulness. As you make your way back to your seats, if you would, find your bulletin. And in your bulletin you'll find the scripture reading for this morning. If you would pull that out as we read together from the book of Psalms, Psalm 107, verses 1 through 9. I'll read the light print, and if you would, respond with the dark. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them out of their distresses. And He led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul. 
We serve a great God who is good and who loves us greatly. Let's worship him and be thankful to him uh, today as we continue in our fellowship together. You may be seated. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Turn to number 560. 560, we thank him for his creation. turn over to number 561 as we sing it together 561 we gather together beauty of the earth, for his care over us, we give him glory. If you'll look to the screen, we come into his presence with thanksgiving.
Trust that again you are motivated to have a heart of thanksgiving this morning as we give it is an opportunity for us to demonstrate that heart of thanksgiving to the Lord so would you pray and let's give father I thank you that again this morning we have the privilege and the opportunity to give in an offering that gives us the reminder that we are mere stewards of what you've given to us may we be faithful in that may we give unto you that father you would be glorified and may the the funds that come in, the things that we have, we, may we use it to be an honor and a glory to you. May it give us the opportunity to share the gospel with folks so that we can shine the light into their lives. May you just again cause us to think about you during this time of offering. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
enduring friend. Your tender mercies like a river with no end. It overwhelms me. Covers my sin. Each time I come into your presence, I stand in wonder once again. Your grace still amazes me. Your love is still a mystery each day. I fall on my knees Cause your grace still amazes me Your grace still amazes me And Savior, you make me whole. You are the author and the healer of my soul. What can I give you? What can I say? I know there's no way to repay you, only to offer you my praise. Your grace still amazes me, your love is still a mystery each day. Still amazes me, your grace still amazes me. It's deeper, it's wider, it's stronger, it's higher. It's deeper, it's wider. It's stronger, it's higher than anything my eyes can see. Your grace still amazes me. Your love is still a mystery each day. Your grace still amazes me. Your grace still amazes me. alone my hope is found he is 
my light, my strength, my star, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. Thank you for your singing. If you have your Bibles, would you open them with me to the book of Ephesians in chapter 5. We're going to see if we can't finish this section today. But uh, Ephesians 5, that just what we sang about, Jesus is the light of the world and he is our strength and all the rest of it. That's exactly what we've been trying to look at last week and then this week we'll kind of finish that up and then we're going to move on to a different, uh, a different part of our walking but you know, again, we live in a dark world and the, the light of our, of our testimony shines into the darkness. And wherever we are at, we bring the light with us. And uh, so I trust that you're learning that in your everyday life. We've been in Ephesians 5. We're going to try to see if we can't get down to verse 17 this morning. But all we want to do is let me go back and read from verse 7 to 17 and remind ourselves of that. And we're going to finish up this thing about being a light. And then we're going to talk about a subject that uh, hmm, can sometimes get us into trouble, which is walking in a circumspect way. So let's begin at verse 7. It says, Therefore, don't be a partaker with them, that is, of the sons of disobedience. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. 
Therefore, he says, wake up, you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We said last week there are three kinds of light, refracted light, which we said is the truth coming through like a prism and being, being distorted, and that's what Satan does with light. The light of the gospel, the light of the word is out there, and Satan has done a very good job of distorting it. People in our world are very unfamiliar with the Bible. They, and if they are, they think it's a book full of errors and, and lies. They, they think somehow it has all kinds of contradictions. They have listened to the wrong voices. And that is the darkness. And we're not going to go back and review all of that because I think, number one, we all understand that. We all understand that the world is a dark place and sin has made it that. Then there was the radiant light which was Jesus. And that's just, again, what we sang about in Christ alone. The light of the world by darkness slain. See, again, the darkness thought they had won. The darkness for the first time thought it had overcome the light. Again, John said it, that light always overcomes the darkness. Darkness cannot have any kind of authority in light. I mean, that just makes common sense. I mean, if you go into a dark room and turn a light on, the light dispels the darkness. I mean, the darkness never can overwhelm a light uh, source, all right? But then what we were dealing with as much as anything was how do we then live as lights in the world? Jesus said that we are lights in the world. Here Paul says that we are light. It doesn't say that we have light. It says we are light. But we're merely a reflected light. We are reflecting our light back into the world that comes out of Jesus Christ. And that is the light that we are. And we talked about how we are a never-go-out candle. No matter how much the storms, and again, even as we sang, I kept thinking about that, even in the fiercest drought and storm, our light is not blown out. It may look like it's out, but it's not. And we continue to shine in the world. And our light is the only light sometimes the lost will ever see. Like I said to you, I, I, I really believe that sometimes it's just a matter of offering and opening sometimes our facilities to those that can come in among us. I mean, uh, we, we rent our facilities out at times, very rarely, but to people in our community, they need a room for this or that. We don't let them do it for, for sinful things. We wouldn't let them have a, a you know, a, a, a micro brew party, you know. Uh, that's not going to happen. But if it's something that, you know, is uh, not sinful, we would do that. I mean, again, you ought to come here. I've said this before, but you ought to come here on a school morning especially if it's some day when the parents need to go over to school. Our parking lot is absolutely jammed. People come through our, our gate every day of the year, and it's a great opportunity for us just to say, hey, here's who we are. And that's why last night it made sense. Oh, and by the way, just so you know, um, if you have, some of you are probably yearly attenders to the, to the uh, Festival of Lights, we got some free advertising. I think it's on the back of the brochure. It's, it has a little ad there for First Baptist Church. They gave us that free because we let them use our parking lot. And um, they were supposed to be giving some of us, staff people, free entry tickets to the Festival of Lights. I mean, you know, it was a great opportunity. And they were here. They, uh, no, Claire, you probably won't be one. Of, she's trying to figure out... <laughs> I mean, there's only a limited supply, you know what I'm saying? Uh, no, I, I have no... That's right, exactly. Uh, I said, among our staff... Oh, brother. Anyway, um, but, uh, but it's an opportunity for us. I mean, like I say, when I watched the video, I, but they didn't know and I had no idea. I thought, well, maybe there'll be a few cars. I mean, this place was jammed. I mean, there was not an empty spot anywhere on our parking lot. And people came and went and 
What if somebody walked on and went, wow, this is a church. I, I want to go to church tomorrow. I mean, uh, what a great thing that would be. Sometimes your light in the darkness is, is, in a, is in kind of odd ways. I think that's exactly why we like to take, in the last little while, we've been doing this thing of taking food and like these bags down to the homeless. I mean, sometimes we look at them and we say, oh, wow, well, those people, they... They deserve what they got. Well, maybe they do, but they also deserve us to be able to show love to them. And if I can take a, a bag with some food in it and some socks in it and a blanket in it, and I can put the Word of God in it and the Gospel of John and a track and whatever, I can be a light there. There are ways that we can be a light in the world, and Paul calls us to do that. And our light is shining. Again, we don't get to say, See, if you're a believer, you are light. Now, your light may be pretty dim because, let's face it, if I'm reflecting light, if, my, if the medium that's reflecting it is really dirty, the light doesn't reflect as well, right? I and mean, that's why you kind of clean a mirror and all that other stuff. I mean, and so the cleaner I am, the better my light. But no matter what, I am reflecting light. I am a reflector no matter how dirty or clean I am. And if you're a believer, you walk into where there's darkness, no matter how little or, or much, you're reflecting light. I mean, you cannot decide, I'm going to turn off the light, and I don't want anybody to know I'm a Christian. No, they will know. Maybe they don't understand it, but you cannot turn off your light. You are light. Like I say, you may be a dim bulb in the pantheon of light bulbs. <laughs> Um, but you may be dim, but you're still shining. And I got to thinking about this this week. You know, our church has been a church always committed to the Word of God. We preach expository messages, right? We, we hold to the exposition of the Word of God. An expository message, this is why you call it that, because it exposes the text, right? Well, I got to thinking, every one of you, are an expository preacher. Because when you walk into darkness, you expose the darkness. That's why people don't like you very well. Especially if your light is reflecting well. If you're a clean surface, then they don't like it too well when your light comes into their darkness. Because you are exposing the darkness. You're an expository message, as it were, to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I put down for myself, you know, <laughs> when that happens, when we preach our expository message, as it were, what kinds of things do the, does the world say? Well, they call us puritanical. You're just puritanical. Uh, you know, you're bigoted. Isn't it always funny how we're the bigoted ones? It's always funny to me how we're the bigoted ones. Now, you don't like me, you hate me, you want to pass laws against me, but you're not bigoted. Hmm, funny how that works, but um, we can be called bigoted. We can be called judgmental. I love that one. I always love it when people say, doesn't your Bible say, thou shalt not judge? It does, in a portion of a verse. But then it goes on to say, judge not, lest ye be judged. And with the same judgment that you judge others, that will be the judgment with which you get judged. I mean, you got to study out Matthew chapter 7. If anybody ever says, that. I'm, I'm allowed to judge. I'm allowed to be judgmental of sin. God's word is, I can be. I can tell you it's wrong to live in open immorality. I can tell you it's wrong to be a liar, a murderer, a thief. It's not judgmental. I'm just Telling you what God says. Well, they say we could be judgmental. They tell us that we're, you're just too narrow. I am. I admit it. But then again, Jesus said, narrow is the way. I don't mind that if anybody ever calls me narrow. I, in fact, the fifth one I put down was we're negative. Do you realize eight out of the ten... Commandments are negative. Eight out of ten. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. God's kind of a negative person. If you want to say it that way. 
really, actually, all five of these, if people actually said this about us, now, understanding, I should, you know, in this day and age, you always have to make sure that you qualify things. We don't want to be holier than thou, okay? Sometimes we act as if we're more, that somehow we're better, and so we want to be very careful that that's not why they're calling us these things. But look, if you're just simply being the light in the darkness, you're simply reflecting the light of Christ in the world of sin, and that's why they call you any one of these things, you should say, well, Lord, it must be working. The light in going into the darkness, it must be working because if they think I'm too narrow, then they understand that I think there's only one way to heaven. That's a good thing. If people can meet you and they think you think I'm okay, you're okay, that's a bad thing. They need to know that there's only one way to heaven and so on. So some of these things, even though they may hurt us in our thinking, they are what we want, in a sense, people to say. You know, I want to just take a moment, if I can, at verse 12. Can I, isn't that an interesting verse? It says it's shameful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. Sometimes people have understood that to mean that we should never speak about sin or sinful practices. And I don't think that's what it's saying. I think it means we need to be very careful of the way we couch some of the things we talk about. When I was in Bible college many years ago, I, I used to find it intriguing some of the students that came who had been saved only for maybe a year or two and had been really saved out of some really bad backgrounds. I had one friend that used to, when I'd hear him give his testimony, I almost felt as if, now you're going to say you're judgmental, <laughs> and maybe I was, and I want to be careful, but I really felt sometimes when he would share his testimony, he spent just a little bit too much time talking about the way he was, as if to almost not glorify it per se, but I almost felt like, wow, you, you could just say I was really deep into sin without you know, exposing every kind of detail and I found an interesting comment. It's a little bit long, but I'm going to read it anyway. I hope you'll stay with me with it. And the thing I found very interesting, this particular commentary was written about 150 years ago. So it reflects the thinking of a commentator, like I say, about 150 years ago. Let me just read you what he, what he says about this matter of shame. He says, It's still a shame to speak of the practices of the pagan. Missionaries tell us, uh, that they cannot describe the images of the field or tell us what's done in idol temples. All over the world, the same thing is true. The check of modesty and virtue would be suffused with shame at the very mention of what is done by worshipers of idols. And the same is true of what is done by multitudes in Christian lands who are not worshipers of idols. Their deeds cannot be described in the circles of the refined and the delicate. They cannot be told in the presence of mothers and sisters. Is there not emphasis here in the words even to speak of such things? If the apostle would not allow them to name those things or to speak of them, is it wise or safe for Christians now to be familiar with the accounts of those practices of pollution and for ministers to portray them in the pulpit and for friends of, quote, moral reform to describe them before the world. The very naming of these abominations often produces improper associations in the mind. The description creates polluting images before the imagination. The exhibition of pictures, even for the purpose of condemning them, defiles the soul. There are some vices which, from the corruptions of the human heart, cannot be safely described, and it's to be feared that under the plea of faithfulness, many have done evil by exciting improper feelings where they should have only alluded to the crime and then spoken in thunder. He goes on. I thought that was pretty good. Made me stop and really think, actually. Sometimes, again, in our open and, um, quote-unquote, open and honest world, maybe we need to be a bit more careful in how we talk about sin. 
I remember it's been many years ago now. I remember hearing a particular radio, um, a Christian radio uh, person that talked about how they were a part of a government, uh, they were asked to be a part of a government study of pornography. And he spoke about how he had to spend hours and hours watching things to be able to be better, um, in a sense, better knowledgeable about speaking about the issue. And, I, and I, when I heard him speak about that, I thought to myself, why would I, like how many of those things would I have to watch to know it's sin? And do I really need to watch any of it to know that it's sin? I mean, we've already seen chapter 5 and verse 3, fornication is our word, is the Greek word pornea from which the English word pornography comes. And so maybe we don't have to be quite as open and honest as it were about some things. Well, let's move on because I'd like to spend some time looking at verse 14 where it says, awake. Wake up. We all know the concept of sleepwalking, right? Sleepwalking is that, is that principle whereby someone looks like they're awake, but they're asleep. Michael, our Michael, still does at times, but when he was a little kid, he would sleepwalk. I mean, you'd find him up, he'd just be walking around, <laughs> you know. We had to put locks on our doors way up high because I thought someday he was just going to walk right out and wake up. And that's when we lived in Baker, Montana. So if he had walked out of the door there, he'd have woke up halfway between Baker and Ekalaka. And I'm guaranteeing you do not want to be halfway between Baker, Montana and Ekalaka. Not because it's a terrible place, just that there's nothing out there. But anyway, so we put these locks on. But there were nights that he would wake up, he would walk up to our bedroom, and he would, this is what he'd say to me, Dad, count with me. I'd say, what? Michael, Dad, count with me. Okay, okay, okay. One, two, no, no, slow down, you're going too fast. Okay. One, two, and he'd count with me. And then I'd say, come on, Michael, we need to go back to bed. Oh, okay. You know, you, I always read that thing. I don't know whether it's true or not. Don't ever wake somebody up or startle them when they're sleepwalking. You know, they could go into a trance or something. I have no idea. So I didn't want to just like go, which is what I wanted to do, boo, you know. <laughs> but I didn't do that because I didn't want my, I didn't want to scar him for life, okay. But there were times, and you would, th and then you'd, he'd wake up the next morning, I'd say, Michael, how'd you enjoy that counting? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, you were up last night again. You know, and we were doing, and he was sleepwalking. He, he had no idea what he was doing. You understand that the, some Christians, certainly none of you that are here, are just sleepwalking through life. I mean, you are oblivious to what's going on in the world. You don't even see the darkness. You have become so, uh, you have become so used to it that you're just sleepwalking. Lost people are dying and going to hell and you walk by them as if nothing is different. There are believers that are just sleepwalking through life. And frankly, there are some of us who need to hear that admonition, wake up. I'm sure on your alarm clock like mine, you have that wonderful snooze button. Right? That's a great device. Snooze. You get nine more. My, in my particular uh, alarm clock, I get nine minutes. Why did they sit at the nine? Why not five or ten? Why nine? Like, who sat in the development of this and went, let's make it nine. <laughs> yeah, I'd be good at sit it for nine. I mean, you know, I, anyway, it's nine minutes. And so I get nine more minutes. And you know what happens at the end of those nine minutes. Boop. This is how stupid I am. I have my alarm set for about 20 minutes earlier than I really want to get up. So the first time it goes off, I can feel good about hitting my snooze alarm. It's like, why don't you just set it for the time you want to get up and then just get up? No, it's funner to just hit the snooze alarm and go off, you know. Some of you, here's what you do. You come to church and God the Holy Spirit is trying to wake you up 
Trying to get you to realize where you're at spiritually and where you're at in your walk for God. Waking you up to the needs around the world. And before you leave here, you hit the snooze button. Oh, I'll do that later. I don't have to get too worked up. Maybe next week. And then next week you come in and you begin to understand God, the Holy Spirit's convicting your heart. And you go, boop, hit the snooze button again. It's a seven-day snooze button. Some of you actually need to hear this. You need to hear, wake up. Hey, go with me to probably the illustration that might pop into your mind. Go to Mark chapter 14. It was certainly the, I couldn't get beyond this thought. The Holy Spirit kept bringing it to my mind because I thought if there's any way to illustrate, wake up, it was the disciples in prayer with Jesus. Well, they actually weren't praying, but that's how we might say it. Mark chapter 14, verse 32. Then they, Jesus and his disciples, came to the place that was called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Listen, folks, you need to wake up and realize the condition that Jesus was in. He was deeply distressed. If you had a wife, a husband, a child, a friend who was deeply distressed, would we just ignore it? Well, it says he took them and he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. Stay here and, what's it say? Watch. Well, you know the story, most of you. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he came and he found them watching. Oh, no, sorry, that's not what it says. You know that. They came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you kidding me? That's kind, of a, that's kind of a little bit of a dynamic translation there, okay? But I kind of think that's the idea. Simon, are you sleeping? Couldn't you even watch for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now you would think, you would think, Peter's awake now. Then he might say to himself, I ought to stay awake. And Jesus went away and prayed and spoke the same words. He returned and found them watchful. Nope, he found them asleep again. Their eyes were heavy. And they didn't know what to say to him. So he said to them a third time, Are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour's come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let's be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. I'm convinced that I think that if Peter, James, and John had actually been praying during the same time Jesus was praying, I'm convinced that Peter would not have tried to slice off the guy's head in the garden. By the way, he didn't try to slice off an ear, right? He hit the ear. He wasn't aiming for the ear. He was aiming for his neck. He wanted to cut the guy's head off. Good grief. Why would you cut somebody's ear off? That doesn't make even any sense. I think Peter would have gone, okay, Lord, I get it. I've been praying with you, and, and I, I understand this is your time, and I need to be strengthened. Oh, wait. If Peter and the disciples had prayed, maybe Peter wouldn't have denied him three times. Maybe he wouldn't have said, that guy, you've got to be kidding me. I don't know him. Some of us need to wake up. I think Paul is using the book of Isaiah for his phrase there about wake up. I think he is referencing at least Isaiah 60 verse 1, if not other verses in the book of Isaiah. I want you to go with me to Romans 13 very quickly because I realize our time is fleeting. And I told you maybe I'd make you thankful this morning if I quit early. <laughs> but look at Romans chapter 13. Just jump right into the middle of the context. Verse 11. Paul says, and do this, knowing the time. 
that now it's high time to wake out of our sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. It's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to look around and to recognize the needs of people. So come back with me. We'll segue with that to verses 15 to 17. Because Paul said it's high time. It's about time we wake up. Well, what time is it? Well, verses 15 to 17, it talks about that. It talks about the time. The first word here is see, behold. I mean, here's the deal. If you really want to see, you have to be awake. See, if you don't follow verse 14, wake up out of your sleep, you're not going to be able to see what's out there. That's why so many people don't see it. They don't behold it. They don't understand it because they are asleep. Being asleep, you are oblivious to what is going on around you until you hear the alarm clock or the or the siren outside, or the dog barking in your neighbor's yard, or whatever. See, he says, you'd better look around. Because we're going to jump to verse 16. We're going to use that. Then we're going to talk about verses 15 and 17. Because he said we're supposed to do something with the time. There are a number of words used in the New Testament to relate to time and time frame. Day, which is used in our text here. Hour, and then two main words, time and um, time. <laughs> They're both translated time and among other things. One is the word chronos. Chronos, you hear the word, English word, chronology. And, and it, it's like our, our watches. The movement of time. Day to day, movement of time. Hour to hour, moment to moment, minute to minute. That's chronos. This is not the word chronos. It's rather the word kairos. Kairos has more the idea of, a, of an appointment. Like again, in your day timer, in your eye calendar, in your whatever you do to write down your appointments. You write it down. Tuesday at 10 o'clock, I have a doctor's appointment. You have an appointment. You have a kairos. And your chronos will move along until 10 o'clock on Tuesday. And then your kairos, your appointment, is there. A kairos is a... That's why often in the New Testament, kairos is translated season. Why? Because we have seasons that come every year at the same time. Fall, winter, spring, summer. They're kairos. They're a appointed time. Even though some years it feels like maybe winter comes after spring or whatever, it's always fall, winter, spring, summer. That's a kairos. So Paul is referring to our era, our time. That's why I think it's, th this is one of those passages that's so easy to... Uh, to, I think, apply because, yes, certainly he was, and we're going to talk about what redeeming means in a minute, but the point is, is that certainly his era was different than ours, but I think it's so applicable. We need to be redeeming, whatever that is, the kairos, the time, the era. We live in a time and that's different than the people a hundred years ago. And our kairos is different than the people who lived in, in Roman times. With people like Nero on the throne and an absolute wickedness that ran through the Roman Empire. These days, these appointed days, notice they are evil. Paul described the time in which he lived as evil days. Wicked days. It's the same word as verse 3. They are Porneira. They are, they are, they are immoral days. I mean, Second Timothy chapter three. We've looked at it before. It's that whole list, nineteen words, to describe our days, our time. 
See, I dare say among this crowd especially, if I were to do a survey, I'm not, so don't raise your hands or, or, or verbally respond in any such way, okay? But if I were to do a survey and say, how many of you think our days are really bad, immoral days? I kind of think I'd get 100%. And for all of us that are older, shall we say, if I were to say, do you think our culture is worse today than it was 50 years ago, again, I kind of think I'd get 100%. Maybe some of you think somehow our culture is better. But this has been an interesting week to me. Because it was 50 years ago when President Kennedy was shot. Some of us are certainly old enough to remember that. Some of you are older than me. You remember it better than me. But I was in sixth grade. I can still remember sitting in my classroom and our teacher coming in and saying, students, our president has been shot and killed. Oh my word. I, I was 10 years old. I mean, I, a 10 year old kid, I, I didn't know much about anything, but I knew that wasn't good. And I think it's been interesting watching some of the, the, the programming on, on what, how the country responded to that and how things, I mean, I thought it was really interesting because I, I concluded in my mind, you may disagree with me, but I concluded that if that event happened today, it would be handled much differently than it was 50 years ago. The days are evil. In fact, that's what, P excuse me, that's what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3. He says, evil men will get worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. Wow. If Paul could describe his days as evil, how much more are our days evil? And if they are, if they are, then the urgency to reach the world with the gospel. Not to change the laws, not to somehow argue over, but to reach people with the gospel. Wouldn't you agree? It's the gospel, and you and I are there for that. And he says the days are evil. We have evil all around us. So what do we do? We redeem it. Redeeming the time doesn't mean that somehow we can save our culture. In fact, some of your translations put it like this, make the most of. I kind of like that. We make the most of every opportunity. Every time, every kairos, then we make the most of it. We say, God then how can you use me to be a light? Some of you work in places where you may be the only light there is. God says, make the most of that. We live in a neighborhood where at least Montessorino, we're the only church. I mean, we're the only light source for miles around us. Oh, I praise God that this church is still in this community because we can be a source of light. He says you make the most. That's why to me, to me the opportunity yesterday was a kairos. It was a, it was a way for us to, to make the most of the opportunity. Somebody's going to pick up that flyer and see our name. Who knows what God might do with that? There was no compromise. We didn't have to, it wasn't a, we didn't, um, like I say, we're not going to let unsaved people do unsaved things. We make the most of it. We redeem it. Well, we're getting close to the end. Why? Let me just say, why do we do that? Because time is short. You and I, our, our life, how's the Bible describe it? Like a vapor, like grass, like a flower. Kind of grows up. Ooh, that's really pretty. Gone. Go with me to Psalm 90. And I think with this we're going to close. Go to Psalm 90. 
Again, you probably have memorized or at least you're familiar with Psalm 90. It's a great psalm for, for those of us especially who have, who have lived a year or two. Psalm 90. The psalmist says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men to destruction. You say, return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like a yesterday when it's past and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood, like the sheep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes, it grows up in the evening it's cut down. Jump down to verse 12. So, in light of all of that, teach us to number our days. That we may gain a heart of wisdom. I, I, I will stop there because I really would like to come back and contrast the fool and the wise in these verses. Paul does something very interesting. He uses two different words for a fool. The word in verse 15 that's translated fool and the word that's translated unwise in verse 17 are two different words. He does it on purpose. Because we're to be people of wisdom. The one thing that every one of us knows is that life is unpredictable. We do not know how long we're going to live. When our friends, when our friend, when Steve told me that our friend's wife passed away just suddenly, she was early 60s, one of the first thoughts that went through my mind was Dave Keel. Some of you remember the Keels at our church and he passed through those same waters four years ago. His wife just died. If I remember the story right, she, felt she died in her sleep. He had gone to work. The daughter came home, found her mom in bed, tried to wake her up, realized immediately she was gone. Gone. So the thing is, you see, we live with the reality that it's not a morbid thing. I'm not trying to, not trying to put some kind of damper on things. It's just that we need to number our days and realize that since life is short, then I need to make the most of every opportunity to be a witness and a light for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we are. Well, maybe some of you have never even come to the light. I don't know. If you've never come to the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to do that so that you can be a child of the light. Okay? Well, we're going to have a word of prayer and we're going to close for this morning. And then um, just to let you know a little bit, this afternoon, you know, we'll go over to have our potluck and all that. We're going to have an afternoon service. We always put in the bulletin 1.30. That's always give or take 10 or 15 minutes. It just all depends on how long it takes us to eat and whatever. And this afternoon, we're going to simply look at Psalm 117 just very quickly. It's not a full-fledged service, but 117. And it, ta it just talks about praising the Lord. I'd love to have you stay with us and eat. Like Pastor John said, there's plenty of food. And um, I would love for us to think about Thanksgiving this afternoon again. So would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that the Apostle Paul has reminded us of what it means to be a light in a dark place. We have believers that are in all walks of life in this world and I thank you for the light of the gospel that shines into those places. For our folks here as they move into their neighborhoods and into their jobs and into their families, for some of them, their light exposes darkness and sometimes people react very strongly against that because they love their darkness. So I pray that you will use us. I pray, Father, that even this morning as we close this service, that we'll be thankful that you sent someone with that light into our lives 
And yet if there's someone here without that light of the gospel in their hearts, may they even this morning desire to come to Christ, to have their sins forgiven, and Father, to be able to then be a child of the light. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.